Okay, we're glad to know that you're still there and watching us. This is The Breakfast on Plus TV Africa, and it's time now to look at the uh, headlines uh, on our dailies. Okay, so we're going to begin with uh, the Daily Trust. Daily Trust will be uh, the first uh, uh, newspaper that we're going to, and uh, Daily Trust has as its... Um, Biggest headlines there, renewed rice smuggling threatens local production. Renewed uh, rice smuggling threatens local production. And the writers there are contraband floods, Lagos, other cities. Women, youths import through Bene, Niger republics. Um, it's dangerous, Mila's won. Presidency, mom on land border policy. Anchor Borua won't be scrapped. A Greek fund said that. Okay, we have... Um, also down there, Tinubu to security chiefs, you must deliver. And then we'll take another one. Uh, presidential tribunal admits EU's election report against INEC, Tinubu. And then, uh, okay. Now, we also have, uh, why I'm still involved in Kano governance, that's according to Conquer. So, okay, that's, the, that's all we will take from the Daily Trust this morning. And we're moving on to Business Day. Business Day newspaper is our next uh, port of call. And the, the biggest headline there is uh, Orosaye report to test Tinubu's cost-cutting champions. Uh, okay, you can find that on Business Day. Top designations for Nigerian travelers and soaring airfares. Amid soaring airfares. Okay, people are still traveling by air. So some people is a surprise. Um, so, we also have absence of witnesses stall INEX defense in obese petition and business activity hits three month low on subsidy removal. Okay, we'll move from business day to The Guardian now. The Guardian newspaper leads with economy awaits. Tinubu's fiscal direction as uncertainty trails affects liberalization. The Guardian newspaper is where we are on now. The next uh, story on The Guardian is APC crisis. Governors NWC Pali ahead of neck meeting. And then uh, police warn against use of orderlies as servants. No consensus on principal officers' election as Senate resumes. PEPC admits EU report CNPP backs observer mission as TMC knocks federal government and INEC. Okay, uh, we'll move on to the Punch newspaper now. The Punch newspaper will be the final newspaper for today on the show. Okay, so the punch leads with retired generals set agenda as Tinubu meets service chiefs. Riders are criminal activities going down. Tinubu picked best hands, according to Ribadu. Retired generals ask service chiefs to cooperate, warn against interference. Then we also have uh, CBN intervenes as more POS operators implement rate hike. Minority leader PDP writes Aquabio order over nominations and electric vehicle NNPCL plants filling stations charging ports. Good news. Then down there we have UTME top scorer's dad declares daughter innocent. Innocent demands probe. Uh, single moms, Lagos businessman circulates more. Okay, that's not uh, a story that we should be looking at. Okay, but uh, that will be all from uh, the uh, newspaper headlines. And we're glad to be joined by someone who will help us make sense of all uh, these headlines that we have read out today. And that is Mr. Chris Kende Wandu, member of the Chartered Institute of Arbitrators in the UK. He's uh, talking with us from Lagos. Good morning and welcome to the program, Mr. Wandu. Good morning. Thanks for having me this morning. Okay. Uh, let's begin with uh, what concerns our belly. Uh, stomach, stomach infrastructure, like the former equity governor will say. Rice. Rice is a staple in Nigeria, not like when we were growing up, when we were 
able to eat rice only uh, on Christmas and uh, New Year and maybe Easter if your, your parents are well-to-do. But rice is a staple now, and the federal government has tried a lot to make sure that local production is heightened. But now that the borders have been opened, renewed rice smuggling threatens local production. That's what the headlines say. Uh, what is your take on that? Um, yes, rice smuggling, uh, you know, but the fact remains that uh, rice has always been smuggled. Um, irrespective of the, uh, despite the closure of the border. Um, we know that this rice coming through Udiroko, um, Udiroko, um, through the back, uh, because we know that Nigeria has some of the most porous borders in the whole world. Uh, it's uncountable. Mm -hmm. uh, we just have about, um, about three to four or five um, designated and uh, known uh, Water points, but we have over 300 others, uh, illegal entry points into the country, making Nigeria one of the poorest. Uh, but it's not only to Nigeria, because even the United States uh, have, we also know that they have border issues. So if you remember um, the campaign by the former president of, uh, of the United States, where he said he was going to lose the uh, he was going to use uh, barbed wire or whatever to demarcate Mexico. Um, from the U.S. and stop uh, immigrants from uh, accessing the U.S. So the issue of uh, border has not to be, it's not only Nigeria and Africans most countries, but the difference between them and what we do here is that we look for have a holistic way of doing things and also use technology to the fullest. We don't even deploy any here. So uh, that's what it is. And um, now to the issue of the rice. The fact is that um, whether we close the border or don't, rice will always come in. But the reopening of the border will now make it more legal for this uh, imported rice uh, to come in. And also that is going to affect uh, uh, production of um, local uh, rice. But the fact that we ask ourselves, are we sufficient enough? Do we produce enough for local consumption? We have about 200 million mouths to feed and that we eat, but how well have we been able to um, use the local rices? Also look at the prices as it were. Um, what is the price of the local rice compared to the one imported? So, but I think the government should do everything money possible to protect the local production. A lot of states have gone into uh, this production, can be states for one, and we even went into the collaboration with Lagos State, another Lagos State, is collaborating with that state particularly on that, the Happy Lagos rice. Uh, a state like Ebonyi, remember the Abakaleke rice has always been subscribed from um, in the days when we were kids. That's why the fact that also you can always find a lot of stone in that rice. Mm. It was just something that we've come to have. And then you also look at the rice that we use for Ofada, which has also become a, a new menu um, a, in our courts. So, um, like we can only wait. the only way this can discourage um, the flooding of such rice is that yes, if you increase the tariff on importation and make it very very expensive, and once to make it expensive, that means that the local rice can can be able to um, uh, compete effectively with imported rice, or else then we are back to what we just okay. Uh, that the local production just die. Okay, Chris, let me, let me just say something here because uh, I'm like an insider. Uh, because you said Abakleke rice has been known for, to have some stones and all that. Uh, let me explain some things to you and the government that is maybe not looking at this. Um, Abakleke rice was milled by local rice uh, machines, very small machines that even at this moment go for less than a million naira to mill. It doesn't have the capacity to select the stones or the break, uh, broken ones uh, from the long grain and all that. But now, with technology, like you're saying, there's some other machines that are also coming out uh, that they call distoner. So you do it in a small machine, you take it also to a distoner, and it comes out without a single stone in that rice. I'm saying this because most of the rice that they call abakleke rice actually come from where I come from, from Ogoja in Cross River State. Uh, because they had that cluster of meals, these rice goes from Cross River to abakleke and they take all the credit. Uh, so 
Now, what I am saying in essence is that the question the government should be asking is, can we produce good enough rice for the consumption of Nigerian populace? The answer, if you ask me, is yes. But has the government done anything that will show that they want us to produce this rice uh, for consumption in Nigeria? I would say no, because now the inputs, farm inputs, are very high because of maybe the dollar or something, I don't know. And then there's no mechanized farming in very many places, at, at least in a, a village where I come from that can produce up to like, like a million bags of, of rice, does not have even one uh, tractor that will plow the place or harrow the land for them to plant and all that. So the government should be asking themselves, what have we not done rather than are we closing the borders or what will make our farmers to sell more or how can we stop the importation of rice? In fact, when the rice floods Nigerian market from the Nigerian farms, I'm not sure anybody will want to go and import rice anymore. So I just wanted to point out that even the Abakleke rice, there is a possibility of processing it without stones. The Ofada rice, yeah. there is a possibility of processing it without stones and effortlessly for less than uh, two million naira, you can have that meal in almost every community that produces rice. But is the government doing it? No. Anyway, yes. <laughs> I like yes. to talk uh, as a farmer. Quickly, quickly, uh, quickly um, yes. um, I'll tell you uh, probably that uh, whether Abakleke rice, oh, okay, Asogoja rice, I know that you... No, call it Abakleke rice, it's fine. <laughs> That's not the yes. argument. No, 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 you have to put it in true context. Yeah. If you produce palm oil in my village, in Ogo, we must stay. Mm -hmm. I will call it Ogo palm oil. Uh, okay. there's no, if you don't blow your trumpet, nobody will know. Mm -hmm. So that is the fact. I will also tell you for the fact that I, as an individual, I prefer this local rice mm -hmm. to um, the imported rice. True. If I go to a party, they ask you which rice do you want, I will say give me a further rice. Good. I go to restaurants, most of them ask for further rice. So, the, what we all need, uh, as I said earlier, is the encouragement, government intervention and encouragement mm -hmm. to the local producers. And don't forget, and that is where even others concerned, we all, this go back again to corruption. You know how many billions and billions of naira that the Central Bank of Nigeria said that it gave out to farmers mm. um, for rice. You remember vividly? You, I'm sure you remember this. Yes, yes. You got to ask yourself, who are the people that received that money? They didn't receive and it in my village, at least. Yes, so, see, nobody. I'm sure your village. I'm sure they didn't receive anything. Nobody. So they just give away this money to certain individuals who call themselves farmers, and they just go away and trade with it. This government didn't do much. The good Lord Jonathan. Um, administration under former Minister of Agriculture, Adichino, who is yeah. president of African Bank. Yeah. Uh, Bank. You, I'm sure you remember what he did with he did the rice. Marvelous. That well. we, we, exactly. That we had so much. It was a bet. The last years of um, this last eight years of um, of uh, Buhari was fitter the way. They couldn't consolidate on that, and that program collapsed. So um, they just um, we, we closing the borders as I said, not closing the borders. What we need to do is for the local farmers to be able to produce more so that we have enough mm. to eat and not only eat but also export most of us from exporting rice mm. to ghana to west african countries and other parts of the world after all the one we buy is it not important mm -hmm. well don't we buy land and the rest of them we can also produce enough and put it in a good shape and also export and that will be a good uh, uh, income uh, uh, foreign exchange enough for us but most of our government don't think they don't just put the, they think it up. That's the problem. Or oh, the cap is just there uh, lying somewhere and they don't want to wear it because. Uh... Nobody wants to wear it. <laughs> okay. All right. Now let's go to a little bit of politics. Um, the presidential tribunal admits EU's election report against INEC and Tinubu. Remember that the federal government has debunked that report or have, have condemned the report. That's the word to use. That the report is nothing to write home about. That it is just a lazy dex job, as they called it. And now the court has, uh, uh, has admitted that report as something that is usable in court. I'd like your comment on that. EU said, uh, we missed it. We missed the point where we could have gotten it right because of X, Y, Z that they mentioned. That the federal government came and said that whoever says that this election was not free and fair and the best election in history is just dreaming. What are your comments? <laughs> It's not just the best election, it's, it's the best election we ever had in the whole world. Why? Mm -hmm. 
but it was the next election. <laughs> Let them produce themselves. The fact remains that um, when I saw the statement by the spokesperson of the like on the EU report, I laughed. And I bet, expectedly, what do you expect from the government to say? If the uh, if the situation changes tomorrow, and then the, the it was APC that lost the election, they won't they, they, they won't they won't say that um, that report was um, uh, wasn't what the paper and sheet it was written on. They will also they will hear it. So that is how we roll here. But the fact remains that the EU did a very very okay, fantastic job. Go and read that um, that report, well detailed. Which one are they disputing? That the um, the I, that INEC transmitted result, presidential uh, presidential uh, election results as uh, to uh, as timely as it, uh, it said it was going to do, or that there was no violence and that people were not prevented from um, putting in certain areas like Lagos and some other parts. And there are so many things that were that, that were captured, and there is nothing that I said it. I've only said that there's nothing that the EU report has that has not been said before that, before now. Even other observers, including the situation rooms, which is made up of um, um, CSOs, Nigerian CSO, uh, headed by um, the situation room, headed by NOB, came out with a damning report. We don't need uh, any EU report to be able to know that that election was flawed and one of the worst elections we've had in recent time. Um, the, uh, the president and the government, current government cannot split his chest and say that this is um, the best we, uh, we can uh, we have. To. That's just like burying this. It's just like an ostrich basically he said in the sun. But if it's not admissible, the, the tribunal or the court have uh, accepted it. So it is admissible, and that is what the court has done. And go beyond that, also at the tribunal, don't forget that um, that was an adjournment because the witnesses, the INEC could not be able to call some of the witnesses they have, they were supposed to call or certain infractions uh, which they could make up. So the tribunal has to be. So, the onus of proof is now on INEC and also the APC. The Labour Party has been able to do its job and has finally done its own submissions and able to. Now it is for the APC and the government as well as INEC to open its defence, and that is what they're supposed to start doing. But we cannot, the, the, the cases are the tribunal or the court as it were, and we cannot talk much about it. Let the um, judiciary do the need to. And the measures mention, mention that they in themselves, but there are so many Nigerians don't longer have faith in the judiciary of which I'm part of. And the, the, the judiciary has a um, ample opportunity to reduce itself now. And if it doesn't, then it's going to be disastrous because, as well as say, it's supposed to be the last hope of a common man. Let it be seen that justice is not only seen to be done, but administered. Um, I also address that issue of technicalities should not be paramount in this issue. And not just because of technicalities, we try to throw away so much evidence that people are going to present. But let's not drop the gun. It is the duty of the uh, tribunal to either operate or um, nullify the election as it were. And it has a certain period that has been given it constitutionally um, to do their job. Unlike before that, it's just open ended. It has a certain period within 90 days. And deliver judgment. Let's wait what happens. Um, as happen. the tribunal. A lot of things could happen within those 90 days. But now, we're seeing what is happening in the courts. Um, like you said, the Labour Party has done its submissions and everything. They have ended. Now it was the turn for the APC and the president and whoever is involved in INEC to do what they needed to do. And yesterday, I think, they went to court and yeah. said there were no witnesses. And yeah. things keep happening that seem to be like uh, the other side stalling uh, this. Do you think the 90 days that was given uh, will be met? Do you think these issues will be addressed yeah. within those 90 days? The, the 90 days is sacrosanct. That tribunal has no power in any case to extend that 90 days by one second. They have no power. The, the, the judgment must be delivered on or before 90 days. After that 90 days, that judgment must be delivered. So they have no, so anybody that refuses to represent his uh, witnesses of, in, in law, in law, we work with evidence. And that is what the judges use to determine their cases. So if you don't provide enough evidence to stop your case, then that's, that's a problem. So if you're supposed to pre present your witnesses and present certain evidence and you're not able to do that, it is left for the God. And as I said, we cannot judge. Let us leave the tribunal to do their job 
when they have delivered their judgment, we as analysts cannot look at the judgment and be able to look at areas where we disagree or agree uh, with them. But as I, as I repeat, the 90 days is sacrosanct and there's not any political about it. Yeah, but the 90 days are for the PEPC, right? Uh, after yes. that, after that judgment, uh, there is room for appeal and all that. There is a possibility yes. it will be dragged to four years or more. So, what no. what do you suggest yeah. can be done? You know, what do you think no. will be done to put a stop to no. that? No, it doesn't. It won't drag for four years. The gone are the days. I have told you, um, a lot of things have happened. The, um, if you also look at the new electoral act, has I'm starting provision on electoral matters, even at the state level. We see a situation where governors, uh, governorship um, election results are uh, uh, goes on trial and disputes, and for years it drags. But as a presidential election, I look at the um, uh, dispute that dragged for almost four years, I remember. But that cannot go. The Supreme Court also is cognizant of that, of this. And um, they know what the loss is, they know what it is. It cannot drop for that long. And um, so um, it's not as, it's not going to be business as usual. You will see real time judgment on issues like this. So if the, if, if, uh, if the uh, presidential election tribunal finishes its job, it will prevent, and they are not satisfied, who is not satisfied, can go to the Supreme Court. And I can tell you that for this Saturday, you know the, what the Supreme Court do, uh, do these days? They are going to give their verdict. But they might not give you the, the, the they will not give you the full content of that value. They will say that we we'll vote this in a later time. They can do that maybe after a month or two or give, but the party they are going to give their judgment. So this is going to be done in real time. So it's not going to it's not like what we had for four years and no no no, it won't happen again. But let's just wait and see. I have always said, I personally have always said and I've always said on this program or that program that we need to think out with our electoral art to make sure that we put in place a situation where before any governor or president he's sworn in would have done with, with the um, issue of court. So that who comes into the office comes in fully ready. We saw what we saw what happened in Kenya. It happened in Kenya. Uh, Ruto um, was uh, was taken, uh, taken to court. And um, yeah, by uh, at least Odinga. And within how many more, within one month or so, a judgment was uh, given, and the president resumed, and you know that. And so we can do this by pushing our election a bit forward. Probably we have an election uh, about seven months before inauguration and president, so that we can give all the uh, court the ability to be able to settle, settle all this issue. Because yeah, it has always happened that whoever comes into office, either at the local government level or state level or even the, um, uh, the, the presidential level, they use the instrument of office to be able to what most of this uh, judgment and the people to influence it. So it is better that we just get it sorted out before anybody becomes either a governor, local government chairman, or even president. That will say a lot of Don't you see an a disadvantage there? Because um, we have only three years of administration in any government in Nigeria. The fourth year is used for election and electioneering. So I don't know, will that not be cutting short uh, the time that people concentrate on administering the state as they should? So, so which is worse, to leave it in perpetuality I'm, for the four years that we talk, we talk ex, about? I'm just exploring all. Years, you, you also talk about that it can drop for years. It would we leave it for perpetuality? Mm. And don't forget that, apart from that, it's also distraction, You as you said. So if a president or governor is being dragged to court almost every month for three years, that in itself is a distraction because it doesn't even know the legitimacy of his office, whether you'll be able to sit on that seat at the end of it. So. Why is it, don't we just get it right, make sure that all this is sorted down within a certain period, and we're done with the case so that when you resume, you resume and you go ahead with your job without any distraction from any angle. That in itself will, will be the day for me. And uh, look at even the National Assembly. If it is the same to happen the National Assembly and the State Houses of Assembly. You see that a, a senator will be, <laughs> will be in the Senate. After about two years, a judgment will come that remove him. You remember what happened. Even Akpabio, this same Akpabio, you remember what happened yeah. during his time. That he was removed after about one year or two years after he was a, he was the mandatory leader uh, in the in the senate and he was removed after about two years so why don't we just get it right and make sure that all these things are issues are sorted out which is why we should be able to create more tribunals not just 
we should create as many tribunals as possible. There are so many judges that can do the job and just get them to get this job done within a certain period. I will get it done with, and governance will start. Okay, uh, talking about uh, choosing people in the National Assembly, um, PDP has written to the Senate President um, on the issue of minority leader, whatever the contents of the letter uh, is. But the, the thing here is that I don't know what you feel about the PDP as an opposition party because right now, someone to take up the minority leader position is a problem. Uh, some uh, camps are talking about uh, Tambuel, Aminu Tambuel of Sokoto State, and others are talking about uh, Agom Jaribe of, uh, of Cross River State to be the minority leader. They're still fighting within the PDP. What are your comments? First and foremost, uh, the senior president has absolutely nothing to do with who becomes the minority leader of the house. That is an exclusivity of um, the party. Uh, minority parties. And what we are talking about, PDP is not only the minority party in the Senate. Labour Party has eight senators. We also have senators from um, NN NNPP. You have senators from um, SDP, I guess. You also have a senator from uh, YPP, uh, uh, Oba. So when, you, so when you are talking of the minority, the problem with the minority is that they have not agreed how to share the offices, not just the PDP. Minority parties have not agreed on. Why some want equal um, um, sharing of the offices, the PDP say, oh, we are in the majority. I think PDP has about 38 or 39 senators. So we are in the majority. So those are the issues. That is one. Two is also the weak um, uh, what we call it, um, article uh, faction of it. The um, the senator being branded, the senator from um, your state, of course, Eva, um, that is uh, being branded as um, somebody that is being pushed forward by the G5. I've come out to say that nobody has spoken to him. I've listened to him twice on two national TV stations saying that nobody has spoken to him. Wick has not spoken to him. Nobody that he does not have any interest in becoming the minority leader of. The, the Senate. But if his colleague in their holiness decide to say, okay, come forward and be, he will be ready, he, he will listen to them. But for now, that he has no. So it is within this minority parties to be able to sort out their problem. And I'm sure they will say, they are talking about the minority parties. It's a problem that APC had in, in um, electing his own um, um, uh, the president of the Senate. That despite all the in intrigues and working by the president and the, and the endorsement by the that someone like um, um, Senator Yari was able to garner about 46 senators out of 109. So 46 or 49 out of 109 senators. That is despite all the intrigues. That means if the president hasn't intervened and the party has really, really not pushed, there's a possibility that Akpabio wouldn't have gotten the. Um, the presidency of the Senate. So that is what, you know, but politics is a very dynamic thing. Mm. Don't listen to these politicians. Don't listen to what they say. They have a way of um, settling their issues. Before you know it now, you just hear them, their eyes happy, their eyes happy, <laughs> and they've got it sorted. So <laughs> let's just leave them to sort out their problem. I'm sure that by that day, you know now, the eyes happy, the eyes happy. Eyes happy. And two of us will come back again as journalists mm. tomorrow to start discussing. So don't, okay. my brother, don't, don't <laughs> drink it. I hope not drip and for these people said that. Okay, thank you very much. Well, that's where we wrap it up on this segment of the show this morning. Chris, uh, as usual, it's been a pleasure having you on the show. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you very much for having me. Have a wonderful day ahead. Thank you. Well, that was Chris Kainde Wandu, member of the Chartered Institute of Arbitrators in the UK. He talked to us from Lagos State. We'll take a short break. When we return, we'll be uh, looking at our first hot topic. Stay with us.